From Shadi to Louis Wallace, Shadi Joy to Louis Wallace. Um, Shadi means, Shad means joy in Farsi. So my parents just chose the translation, I guess, for my middle name. Um, I was born in Sydney, in Blacktown, Sydney in 1989. And um, at the age of two, my family decided to move to the Baha'i World Center. At the time, my dad was a civil engineer and my mom was an architect. Um, and they decided to do uh, some service. It's unpaid work, um, volunteer work, and they take care of everything for you. So um, as my, my sister was six months old, I was two. They packed up and left and went to Israel. And we were there for seven years. And I went to an Israeli school there for four years, for the whole time, really, from the age of three. You start Gan, and then you go to Gan two, and then you go to year one, two, three, four. My mother comes from a Jewish background, an Iranian Jewish background. Her mother and father were both Jewish before they converted to the Baha'i faith, um, which therefore technically makes me Jewish. And um, so my grandfather became a Baha'i um, through his brother, who he initially kicked out of the family because his brother became a Baha'i, and because of the love that his brother showed towards my grandfather, um, my grandfather started investigating the faith and became a Baha'i. And his, his father was very, so my great-grandfather was very open-minded and um, was very positive about that, about the Baha'i faith at the time. And I um, don't know the story about my grandmother, but I think she comes from a Baha'i family who became Baha'i. And my father came from a strong Irish Catholic family. Um, my father was going to become a priest, if I'm, if I'm correct, after he went to a Catholic boarding school for his entire life in New South Wales. And um, there was something in, it, in the Bible, or there was something that they were learning that, you know, if you don't believe in the Bible, you're going to hell. And my dad's like, well, there's all these wonderful people all over the world. And how could they be going to hell just because they don't believe in the same thing that I do? So he left the faith and he became a commercial fisherman in New Zealand, in the South Island for 10 years. And he came across the Baha'i faith and became a Baha'i. And my parents met at the opening of the Samoan temple. We have seven temples all over the world, one in Chicago. And um, they met at the opening of the temple. So my mom was working as an architect in San Francisco at the time and my father was working as a fisherman in New Zealand. Um, my mother's family left four years before the revolution, the Islamic Revolution, and went to Canada when my mom was 15. So they weren't affected by the revolution, but they lost a lot of property and belongings. When you're first born as a Baha'i, your grandfather or father whispers a prayer into your ear emotional thinking about it and um I don't know what it is but it's really beautiful and then from that moment on you kind of I guess you're protected by God and then this is so stupid um at the age of two when we moved to the Baha'i World Center I remember visiting the shrine of Bahá'u'lláh for the first time and putting my head at the threshold so stupid and um and then my mom telling me like how I was supposed to act when I was at the threshold of the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith and um I guess that reverence has stuck with me for the rest of my life I remember walking along there's like a big pathway with white pebbles and I remember hearing like the crunching sound and my mom's singing this prayer that they used to sing. It's just like, it's Ya Baha'u'llah Pa, which means the glory of God. And she'd sing it to us while we were sleeping. And um, she was singing it as she was holding her hands and we were walking to the threshold of Baha'u'llah, which is something that a lot of people can't do. So it's very special. And I remember walking inside, you take your shoes off, and I remember walking up these little stairs and then there's a door and it's got gold 
like flowers. It's like a wooden door and it's got gold flowers all over it. And then you push that open and you walk inside and there's like a big area and it's all carpeted and there's little rooms on the sides. And there's a big skylight and plants kind of just hanging from the skylight. And this is where the hall is buried. And I just remember going straight to the threshold and it's like a little step. And then there's this big room and that's, he's buried under that. And it's a big, like a, a mesh curtain so you can see inside. And I just remember putting my head on the threshold and um, smelling these fresh rose, rose petals that they put on the, on the threshold. And you just put your head down on your hands and you say a prayer. And I probably said like, oh God, guide me, protect me, make me a shining lamp and a brilliant star. Thou art the mighty and the powerful. And that's probably the first prayer that I ever learned as a child. Yeah. And what do you remember after that? I guess that feeling of protection, relief, that you're being watched over. And it's like a, like a thing that you've been raised with, but it's coming, it's like a physical manifestation of what you believe in, to be in that room or in that atmosphere and at that certain place. Like if you think about it, this is a place that every Baha'i in the world faces when they pray. And just that power that one place has is truly phenomenal. Being a Baha'i was always it as a child because that's all I knew. As a child growing up in the Baha'i World Center, you're surrounded by friends who are all of Baha'i faith, like belong to the faith. Um, all the people that you socialize with, unless you go to a school locally, which I fortunately did, are Baha'is. Um, your family's friends are all Baha'is. You've got the shrines at your disposal. You have Baha'i texts at your disposal. Um, so that's all I knew. And it wasn't just a Baha'i, being a Baha'i, but it was being an Israeli. Like, I, is, Hebrew was my first language. And Growing up in a mixed culture, I also spoke English and Farsi, and I started to learn Arabic at the age of like eight. Um, so, and, and being an Israeli, like, you know, going and hanging out with my Israeli friends and, and eating Israeli food and, you know, wearing their clothes and that culture, that smell, that behavior and that, that relationship they have with people, you know, it's very direct but very loving at the same time. That was what I was surrounded by. So when I left, um, I moved to Australia and we, we went straight to a, a neighborhood which is predominantly Caucasian or white South Africans. Um, and so I was probably the most ethnic person they'd seen up to that point, a lot of these people. And so I'd really had struggled fitting in. Um, but I stayed, I guess I stayed faithful. Um, it was never a question of faith, it was just what faith. And then at the age of about 14, I guess I started being tested with, with my surroundings. I was questioning things. I was like, you know, is Baha'u'llah just another guy? Or, you know, is faith or religion just something that's limiting us as human beings when we could be exposing ourselves to so much more and I guess gaining something from those experiences? Um, and then I started to research other religions. I looked at Islam, I looked at Hinduism, I looked at Judaism, um, Catholicism, Baptism. And then I just figured being a Baha'i made sense. It was easy. It was just, it was easy. Everything made sense. But I guess I truly, I had a lot to learn. Um, and so, there's this program called Education for Peace, and it's open to everybody, but it's organized by Baha'is. And at the age of about 
14, 15, I started to go. And it was an eight day residential. And you learn about things about um, manifestations of God, manifestations of self, um, how God is perceived within us. And we're just like a lamp and he's the light inside. And um, we look at spirit of, the spirit of faith and what that means and the, the covenant, that promise you make with God when you claim, when you declare yourself as a Baha'i. Um, you look at the history of the faith and all these things. And so it's an eight-day residential and then you do a 12-month series of assignments. So every month you do an assignment. And I guess this built my identity as a Baha'i. It contributed to my understanding of the whole scope and the whole picture of what I was really a part of. And it's not just a belief, but it's a lifestyle. And it's the ideal lifestyle that we should all lead and strive to lead. Um, and so I did this for over a course of about four years. Um, and then, yeah, and I guess it reaffirmed my belief. At the age of 15, you have, um, it's, it's when it's your coming of age. So between the ages of 15 and 21, you're encouraged to investigate other religions. The Baha'i faith has a strong belief in personal investigation of the truth. So anything that comes down to like, even rumors, anything, we're, in, we're encouraged to investigate the truth for ourselves. And whatever we see fit, we believe in. And so when it comes to religion, we're encouraged to investigate all religions and whatever we see fit, we, I guess, we promise ourselves to. And we don't do it half-heartedly. We do it to our best of our abilities. Because, you know, God has granted us with this message. My parents never pressured me. And it's something that Baha'i parents never do. Um, they, they would like you, obviously, to become a Baha'i. But at the age of... 15, with, you know, from age 15, it's, you're considered as, um, it, what is the word, there's a phrase that they use, but it's the age of um, understanding, and it's when you're able to comprehend things, and your consciousness has matured um, to a level of understanding that is equivalent to everyone else's above that age. So, age of 15, I think I was, about, I was about two weeks away from turning 15 and I signed the card. Um, and then I think as I got a bit older in my teens, like 16, 17, when my friends started to experiment with drugs and alcohol and sex, I kind of, I got a bit tested because I guess I was curious just like everyone else was. Um, but also I was like, does this really truly mean that much to me? Is that really, like, can, is this really gonna change the world? Is this, am I really part of something big? And so then I kind of started to reevaluate everything. And then I, um, I got involved in this junior youth empowerment program at the age of about 17. And the junior youth empowerment program is, uh, it looks, as, it looks at raising the level of consciousness, um, an elevated conversation, the power of expression, um, and it really looks at, its main purpose is to create avenues of service. Because if you don't know, if we can't unite our own communities, how are we supposed to unite the world? So I got involved in this program as a mentor, as an animator, and there's a lot of training that goes into it. And this is all um, Baha'i inspired. It doesn't have, it just has its teachings. It doesn't have anything about the faith in it. It's really to, um, it's a socioeconomic development program, which is to improve communities. That's it. And, and you know, increase dialogue. Um, and also it's a literacy program. It's done really well in countries like Colombia and Uganda and Rwanda where people aren't very educated. Um, and in Australia, it's done wondrous things as well. So I got involved in that. And then I saw that this faith isn't just a religion, but it's a movement. And it's something that 
has potential to change the world. It's not just something they just talk about, like all these other people that I see everywhere. No offense. <laughs> but you can't just pray about it all the time. You have to do something. My parents instilled that concept of community service and service in itself. From a very, very, very early age, I remember everything that I did without being asked or that was, that it was a benefit to someone else, my mum would say this is service. It was just a moment, like it kind of clicked. Um, I was always, you know, I was always curious how, you know, is Baha'u'llah a real guy? Like, is he a god, you know? What is he? Who is this guy that um, has written all this amazing stuff? You know, is he just some other dude or who claims to be a prophet? Or is he a real, like the real deal? So um, I kind of, I just settled. Um, there's some things that we'll never know. Um, and it's to our benefit. But at the age of 18, I went to do a year of service in the Baha'i World Center. Um, I wanted to go back as from the day we left, I wanted to go back. And during this whole time, I guess, growing up in a mixed cultured family, speaking various languages, growing up in a country like Israel, where there's, you know, so, meant so much fusion of, you know, Russian, Ethiopians, um, Arabs, Jews, you know, that come from all parts of the world. I never truly felt like I felt fit in and like the way I talked, the way I dressed, you know, all these kinds of things are really important to you during your teenage years. You need to fit in. And I could never fit in. And I'd usually, I always felt conflicted. Which side should I take? Should I take my Iranian side? Should I take my Australian side? And so this kind of always stuck with me. Um, and then I went to Israel and I was like, man, I'm Israeli. Like everything I love, is in this country, um, the culture, the people, the lifestyle. Um, you know, it's a, a hub of so much spirituality as well. And um, unity in some sense, because these people live amongst each other. And, you know, it might not be good all the time, but they still live on, you know? So, like, I'm Israeli. This is the first day I arrived in Israel. I was like, I'm Israeli. And then through my service, I worked as a Jani um, cleaning one of the buildings in the World Center. If you look at a picture, there's like four buildings. I worked in one of them, and they're like multi-billion dollar facilities. And I'd clean toilets for like five hours a day. I'd clean dining halls. I'd go clean chairs, like with the rag and windows. And this is something I actually wanted to do from the day we left Israel. I wanted to be a Jani. And the first day, I was like, what the hell was I thinking? But this is service. This is your sacrifice to God. And this is a way of, this is a way of prayer, like connecting with him through service. And so, identity crisis. So I'm thinking like, I'm Israeli. But then, you know, I'm a Baha'i. I'm, I'm not Israeli. I, I know, I'm, I'm Iranian, I'm, Eng I'm Australian, I'm Jewish, I'm Catholic, I'm Baha'i. And so there was a point in time where this, I met this man from Portugal who'd grown up in France um, and his family moved back and forth between Portugal and France and he wasn't raised as a Baha'i, but he spoke fluent Portuguese, fluent French um, and grew up in both countries and never could identify himself as a member of either one. And so I go, what changed? He's like, well, when I found the faith, I felt like something, I felt like I belonged somewhere. And it's that third culture. And to me, the Baha'i faith is like the third culture. It's like the prime culture. It makes, it's that fusion of everything that makes up our identity. That's the third culture. It's your belief, it's your lifestyle, your future occupations, your cultural orientation. So yeah, I'm a Baha'i, that's my identity.
It was hard. I worked from 5.30 in the morning to 4.30 in the afternoon, five days a week, cleaning. And to think this is something that I wanted to do my entire life. But it was service. And I served with people from 80 different countries, um, various languages, cultural backgrounds. I lived with seven flatmates. I had a Polish flatmate, a Mongolian flatmate, an Indian flatmate, a French, an American, a Panamanian, a Peruvian, Taiwanese, and then there was me. And this is over the course of a year, so people would come and go. And. Um, it was tough living like that. Um, you all have different standards of living, different expectations. Um, I worked very closely with my fellow co-workers. You'd wake up, you'd say prayers together, you'd get driven up to the Ark, which is where the Baha'i World Center is. You'd get driven up, get there, you say prayers with your crew, and then you'd start doing your morning work. And mine was cleaning toilets. And I'd clean level one to five toilets for three hours every morning. And then you'd clean up and you'd have breakfast. And you'd go back to work for another two and a half hours. You have lunch together. And you go back to work again. And you go home after you finish. And then there was always something. There was always a dinner, a party, a, a class, a deepening. Or you'd go to the shrines. You're always encouraged to go to the shrines because you're never going to have that opportunity again. And so this was my life for one year. And I think, I know I made the most of it. I, there was not a minute in the day that was wasted. I was either deepening on the writings, on the history, on the teachings of the faith, or I was meeting wonderful people from different parts of the world. Um, it's also where the, the Universal House of Justice resides. So you're surrounded by these amazing human resources that, you know, they're part of the administrative order of the Baha'i faith and it's quite powering. So, yeah, I made wonderful friends. Um, I was tested when I had an opinion about how things could be done better. People didn't really care. It's been done like that for years and that's the way it's going to be. Um, and different cultures like working together doesn't always pan out as happy and as you seem it's going think it's going to be um, but you live on because you're all doing it for the same reason and one thing that actually kept reminding me to live through it was the fact that you know god loves god created us because he loves us and therefore we should love each other and we're all created equals so just remembering that we're all little cherubs of God's creation, um, I guess, helped me calm down sometimes when I was a bit outraged. Yeah, but it's what the world's going to be like one day, and we have to be ready. I came home in the beginning of this year, so I came home in January, and it was just in time for a an international conference. There were 42 conferences held in every part of the world. And um, it was to mark the, the success of the Baha'is all over the world and to also see where we should go next. It was very, very exciting. And um, I made it three days in time, made it just to get to make it here. And I um, had three days at home, and we, my family and I flew down to Sydney. And the conference went for three days. And um, that was my homecoming, and it was wonderful. Then I got back home, and that wasn't so wonderful. It was like a reality check, you know? I couldn't, it was a recession. Um, a lot of my friends had drifted away from me. I'd had this amazing experience. And A, they hadn't changed, and I changed a lot. And B, they didn't really care about it. And that really hurt me. And I was very dependent on my family financially. And I had never been, because I couldn't find a job. Even in just like a small, casual position, I couldn't find anything. And the Baha'i community had progressed so much. 
and expected me to fall into that. And it was very difficult for me because um, I was still, my head was still back in 2008. And it was definitely when I came home. I wrote a song called Or Nightingale and it's on the album. And in it I said, surrender yourself to his will because I was really struggling as a Baha'i. I just had this amazing experience, but what did that mean to the world? And like, how was I supposed to apply it into my daily existence? And how could I influence other people to become better people? Um, and so when I came back was definitely the hardest time of my life and the time I really depended on God to give me strength. I developed a family like in, in Haifa. I had friends that I probably will never see again, that I shared like intimate things with on a spiritual level, like living and working with people and serving with them really connects you with them on a, a level that you will never experience again any other point in your life. And I really miss them. And I couldn't fit in here because I was different from what I was before. And so, yeah, I prayed a lot. And then I wrote a song. What are the words for the song? Um, well, it's called Our Nightingale. And the nightingale is Baha'u'llah in a tablet which he wrote to his believers after just declaring his faith. He says, um, he is the, um, Lo the nightingale of paradise singeth upon the twigs of the tree of eternity, with holy and sweet melodies proclaiming to the sincere ones the glad tidings of the nearness of God. And it's a really long prayer. But just the beginning, you know, I'm here and I'm like watching you and I'm helping you. Because the, the highs at that time were going through a lot of tests with Baha'u'llah's banishment. And um, he refers to himself as the nightingale. And so I say, oh nightingale in the rose garden of love. And then I, I plead to God, I'm like, um, you know, what? What's the verse? Basically, I'm saying like, have you turned away? I bow down and pray. I need your assistance. Where are you? Um, where are you when I need you the most? Or Nightingale, like help me. And then I end it with, um, Like, are you for real? And um, is this the right time for me to be back here? And what should I do now, basically? I can't remember the words right now. I always forget the words to my own songs. It's pathetic. I don't know why. I think it's just like, when I write it, I go into this trance. Because I'm so, like, involved emotionally and then it's just gone straight away. When it's finished, it's gone. It's out of my head. And it was a really dark time of my life. I fell into depression and I had to see a counselor because um, I live out of home and my mom's Persian. It's not like I can move back home and she's going to be all independent and stuff. It's just culture. Um, so she was very like motherly and protective of me and and I was this independent girl who lived in Israel on her own for one year, who traveled to Paris and Germany on her way home, on her own. I wasn't that little timid girl that left for Israel. And um, I was really struggling for my independence and my own identity. Because that identity I developed in the Baha'i World Center was not in any ways going to transfer to the real world. It was just going to stay there. And so I had to rebuild myself. 
and that's probably when I relied upon God the most. I got through it in the end. What happened? I wrote an album. I had stuff to distract me. I needed a distraction. I'd gone from doing, I literally had about five hours of sleep a night when I was in Israel. That's how much advantage I took of being there. So my life was very busy and I came back and I had nothing to do. It was just dull. I had, my friends had neglected me for the first six months I was back home. They're just so caught up in their own worlds. They're all artists and philosophers and it's the kind of crew I'm a part of. And, you know, they were all in, caught up in their world. And I got back, and I'm like, oh, Shadi, how long have you been back for? I was like, six months, thanks. Then I'm going to have to make an effort as well. Like, what are you going to do? It works both ways. Um, I wrote an album. I started to paint. I started to um, design things. I started to sew again. I started to talk to people. Yeah. I got involved with the faith more. Yeah, I got busy. It's when I keep myself busy, I feel productive, that I'm happy. Yeah, but I also had more me time. Me times when I go away randomly and I reflect on everything in my life. Because if you don't reflect, you can't improve and you can't move on. Yeah, Baha'u'llah says, bring myself to account each day. Every day, go think about it. My grandfather had a beautiful voice. My my mom's grand, my mom's father had a beautiful chanting voice, and he had like this, you know, strong, like Yiddish kind of Iranian Farsi accent when he'd chant. And I only know this because I've my mom brought back records of his voice because I don't really remember it that well as a child. He passed away when I was about 10. Um, and my dad's family, my dad's father especially, was a very amazing pianist. So both males in the family. My dad was a drummer and he was always listening to Katie Lang, Simply Red, Van Morrison. My mom was just obsessed with Mariah Carey. Tracy Chapman, the Seals and Crafts, Simon and Garfunkel, Cat Stevens. So I was brought up with music and living in the Baha'i Wall Center as a child, you're surrounded by all these Africans and Irish people and Irish love their music and these South Americans and they all sang all the time. And I learned all my prayers through music. All the prayers I memorized as a child was through music. Because, like, we believe that music is a ladder to the, sp the, s the soul or the spirit. And if you can combine the hidden words, you know, the words of God with music, it's so powerful. And so I sang from the very first day I could remember. And it's funny because I never thought that was true until my mom just got back from the, the U.S., in Canada and she brought back all these CDs, these DVDs that were VHS like, you know, and no one has a, one of those anymore. So she took, she found them at my auntie's house and said, can you please transfer these to DVDs so I can take them back home. And there's videos of me like singing songs in Hebrew and at the age of like three and singing songs in English that make no sense whatsoever. I'm making it up as I go and I've got like this vibrato in my voice and I'm just in my own world. And there's this video, of, like I'm like this miniature me, you know? And so I never thought I'd been singing from day one, but I, I have been. And my dad tells me that when I was a baby, I used to gargle my own spit. And like, that's what you do when you start, you're about to sing. You're like, Ugh. Anyways, so um, I didn't take it seriously at the, about the age of four, I mean, from the age of about 12 to 16. And then my mum bought me my first guitar at the age of 12. And um, it's okay, it's my phone, I'll just let it go. That's okay. I'll let it go, I'll let it go. And um, my mum bought me my guitar, this guitar, and I was like, why the hell did you buy me a guitar? She's like, I just want you to learn how to play it. 
And I wasn't taking my singing seriously at that stage. And then um, my mum put me in a state choir. And I guess that's when it started to kick in. I did sing in primary school a lot. Like I was music captain, I was choir captain. When I was about 12, I think that's when you're, when you're finishing primary school. And I was very heavily involved in the singing program, but I didn't take it that seriously. I don't take it seriously ever, actually. But then at the age of 12, my mum bought me my guitar. And I guess I started to focus on guitar a bit. Then I put that aside and I did nothing, because that's when I was having like my identity crisis. Like, where do I fit in? Who am I? And then um, I met this girl who sang and played guitar, who was a Baha'i. I was like, man, I've got a guitar. I should learn. You know, I should learn how to play. So I learned a song. I took it home. I practiced. And then I got bored and I learned more songs. And then my parents like, we'll put you into lessons, you know? So I started taking lessons. I started taking serious singing lessons. And by that stage, I'd quit the choir. Um, decided to work on the weekends instead to earn some money instead of spending it. And um, I started playing and singing guitar at the age of like 15, 16. And that's when I started composing prayers to music. Because I thought if, I sh if I'm going to do this, other people should, you know, share in the experience. I could teach others and they can teach other people and make the words of Baha'u'llah sound more beautiful. And then it just all stemmed off from there. I started taking serious singing lessons at the age of about 16, 17. And I did a few Steadfords and examinations and stuff. But I was never, my parents never encouraged me. They were loving about it. They were like, you know, you should pursue this. But always have your education as a backup. And, you know, they, and they were never like, oh, shadi go sing, shadi go sing. You, have a, you know, this is your opportunity to shine. They were never like that. My parents always reminded me to stay firm and to, you know, keep my head leveled. And so um, I just never wanted to take it seriously because I knew the second I started taking it seriously, I'd become egotistical. And, um, and then people who are like that never succeed in life. And so, yeah, I just don't like to take it seriously because I love it too much. And it's not just the singing aspect, it's music in general. Um, when I was in the Baha'i World Center, I was surrounded by all these people from all these different countries. And I was listening to 11 hours of music a day. Literally, my iPod was in my ear from the word go to the time, I, like the moment I was in bed, like I was listening to music. And I was exchanging music with my friends. Um, they were bringing stuff from Germany and Colombia and Chile, and I got all this awesome Cameroon, you know, African French stuff. And like, I just got so much music, and like, the world was my little oyster. Is that what they say? And so, not just performing, but I love being in an atmosphere with music. It just takes me to a different place and. If there's a moment of silence, there has to be music. Otherwise, that moment of silence doesn't mean anything. It's just silence. When did you write the Unity Prayer? I wrote the Unity Prayer. It was the last one I, com I needed a tenth track for my album. Because you can't have an album with nine tracks. It doesn't make any sense. Even though nine was a holy number, and I was like, nine would be good, but ten is better. And in probably June of this year, I got together, I wrote, I, I did the basic riff or like a 6-8 timing in that, in that chord progression and then I gave it to my producer and he played around with it and made it his own and yeah, and that's really him. His name is Louis Shelton and um, he's a phenomenal musician. He just got inducted into the Hall of Fame in Nashville. He played the I Want You Back track for Jackson 5. That was him on guitar, like 50 something years ago. And um, he, they needed that guitar and he had to give up that guitar and put it in a glass case. And it was probably the hardest moment he's ever done, had as a musician. It's like, it's a bittersweet thing, you know? Like he's from Nashville, Tennessee. He's got a really strong accent. Um, 
yeah, working with him was absolutely like the highlight of my potential, if you want to call it that, music career. The guy's like a legend. You just walk into a studio and it's covered with gold platinum records from Lionel Richie, Simon Agar, Funkle, Seals and Crofts, Ella Fitzgerald. How did you meet with him? He happens to be a Baha'i. And he heard me sing. He doesn't like to make that like well known. Neither do I actually, because it makes it seem like I'm nothing. <laughs> I just have I have connections. Um, he heard me sing, and he liked what he heard. Him and his wife work like business business partners, and they like what they heard. And this was literally about a couple weeks before I went to Israel. So they gave my dad their card. They said, if you ever are interested, let us know. And then I sang at the conference when I got back from my year of service in front of six, 7,000 people. And my parents were like, she's got something. People know her, people like her. So they invested in me and Louis' family invested in me. And then we made an album together. Yeah, and he's the most cruisy, laid back, but efficient professional guy. Um, and I developed a deep love for him and his wife and their dedication to the faith and their love of music and their professionalism. They have so much to offer musically. They've had so much experience. So yeah, they were like my mentors, my musical mentors. So I'm very grateful for their accompaniment. Yeah, and I don't think it's the end of the line now that we finish the album. I reckon there's like, there'll be more to it. Even if we don't work together, our relationship will always remain positive. Music. And the sacrifice of my parents. They've done a lot for our family. And I'll be eternally indebted to them. What's your greatest wish? World peace. <laughs> Kidding. I mean, that's beautiful too. Um, that, I don't know, people wake up. That level of consciousness needs to improve like everywhere. People need to be more aware of their surroundings. They can't live in the ignorant bubble that they do. And if that means that, you know, governments are gonna have to change policy, that music is going to have to become, or media is gonna have to sacrifice something for their integrity. Things like that have to change. Things, big things have to change for people to wake up and whatever. But the level of consciousness, we're, we're, we're so much, we're so capable. We have so much capacity and I don't feel that humanity is utilizing it enough. And that will only happen if we become more aware of our surroundings. Is that, your, is that a good answer? I mean, world peace would be lovely, but that's not going to happen until people start recognizing everything around them. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry that I cry the entire time. <laughs> it bothered me too. <laughs> uh oh. I uh, love, uh, okay. You want a message? No, no, you're, you're, I mean, what you said was kind of a message. Yeah, a message. I want something profound, but I'm only 20. Who am I? Seriously, who am I to, like, have a profound message? I'm nothing. That, I'm strong, but... At the same time, I don't know what I want in life. I'm just going with it. My two greatest fears, three greatest fears, 
uh, disappointment, regret, and the fear of God because he's just and we don't know what he's capable of. So with that in mind, I don't want people to think that in my portrait that I'm naive. So I guess I want them to think that I'm strong. Doesn't sound quite in tune. Sorry. I hope that works.
hazy, all-knowing, real wise. And that's how a lot of prayers either begin or end. It's to remind us that no matter who that higher power is, he's the all-knowing, real wise. That's it. And you just got to remind yourself that we're just little, we're little puppets. And God has this amazing plan for us. And we don't know what that plan may be. But whatever it is, it's great. I don't know what's going to come of it. But the fact that people care is beautiful. And I've never really been surrounded by people of faith from other religions to this degree. So um, it's very powerful. Yeah. I'm not going to have any makeup left. If you have Kleenex, that would be lovely. Do we have any Kleenex furniture? You're going to edit this? <laughs> Look, the problem isn't you're crying, actually. The problem is this. I know. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. Yeah. I'm worried about all the black makeup that's going to be around my actually, face. You're in good shape. Oh, yeah. oh man. Thank you, you so much. Service, yeah. Thank you. I'll take two. <laughs> I'll be okay. I have to go out after this, so I hope it doesn't look bad. Okay. <laughs>